Okay, we're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and verse number 1. Find the book of Ephesians. You go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then the book of Ephesians. So how many is that? About 9 or 10 books in the New Testament. So uh, give you a moment to find that. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. First Corinth, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. And uh, we'll read down through verse number 10 and preach on the spiritual life of the believer or just spiritual life. What is spiritual life? Verse Chapter 2, verse number 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among, among whom also we had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through, Jesus, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, wherefore God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. As I live longer and the further time passes, I am more convinced than ever that most churches have a lot of lost people in their pews who claim to be Christians, who may be even... Um, members of the church, they've been baptized, they've gone through all the motions, but there is no reality in their life. Harry Ironside wrote this. Let me, let me quote him. He was a, a great preacher back in the early uh, 1900s. And he said, Shallow preaching that does not grapple with the terrible fact of man's sinfulness and guilt, calling on all men everywhere to repent, results in shallow conversions, and so we have a myriad of glibbed tongue professors today who give no evidence of regeneration whatever. So he talks about shallow preaching that doesn't mention sin, the man's guilt, doesn't mention repentance, results in shallow conversions. And the people of the result of that give no evidence of having been saved, regenerated, raised from the dead. So you understand this morning that salvation is more than just being forgiven. It's more than just going to heaven. It's more than just going to church and sitting in a pew. You notice in verse 10, if you look at verse number 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We were not saved by our good works, but we were saved unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so he says, oh, we're not saved by that. Not a matter of fact, in verse 8 and 9, he says, for by grace are you saved by faith, uh, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not preaching salvation by works, but we're preaching a salvation that works. And if a salvation doesn't work after it professes Christ, 
does something wrong, the Bible says in the book of James that faith without works is what? Dead. It is dead. And so, you know, Jesus talked about it. He said, good trees bear good fruit, and corrupt trees bear corrupt fruit. So if a person says they're Christian, but they're still bearing corrupt uh, fruit, then we know that they have not been genuinely born again. In Hebrews chapter 6, Paul writing to the Hebrews, said that I am persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation. So he says, if you say you're saved, there's some things that accompany salvation. Uh, there's some things that go along with being saved, things that you're not saved by those things, but they accompany salvation. They, they follow salvation. So there's so many scriptures, you know, he's talked about those for many will say in that day have we not prophesied in thy name and done many wonderful works. And he said, I profess unto them, I never knew you. And he goes on to give a parable about the wise men uh, and the foolish man and how they built both of them built, but they built upon the wrong foundation. And so life, the life of the God, the spiritual life of the Lord, and how it is manifest in our life. Notice, let's take the word life for a moment. The Bible says that God is light, and God is life. God is life. He just doesn't have life. He is life. He has always been life. He is that eternal life. Never having had a beginning, never have an end. He is life and life eternal. And he is the sole source of life. There is no other place to get real spiritual life rather than through the Lord Jesus Christ. Your physical life this morning, if you're physically here and you have physical life, where did that come from? It came from God. Bible said that man, God created man uh, in the image of God. God created Adam and Eve in the garden and that they had life, physical life, and they had spiritual life until they had sinned. So he's the only source of life. You know what people are doing today is they're seeking life. They're seeking the uh, entertainment of life, the joy uh, of life. They're seeking happiness. Uh, uh, they're seeking all kinds of things. But they never really find it until they find Jesus. Man, when I found Jesus, I found life. I, I came from the dead and I found life. So there is just life. God is life, the source of life. He is the only source of life. And then we could talk about creation life. You think what power was manifest at creation? I'm talking about God created the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets and the galaxies. Didn't come out of a big bang theory. I mean, if it did, there's a big explosion because all these galaxies are light years away. Have you had one explosion and it blows all these uh, planets out and they're all perfectly round and they uh, are in their own little orbit and they have moon or some of them have more than one moon and then you have the Milky Way galaxy, you have other galaxies and there are galaxies beyond galaxies beyond galaxies and galaxy, galaxies that they've never even found yet. The, the telescopes cannot go that deep into space. And so God is the creator of life. He gave power. Eternal God, the eternal God, stepped out of time or out of eternity and stepped into time and created time. He gave us time. He said the first day and evening were the first day. And so he created time. He gave life to animals. He gave life to the plants. He gave life to the fish. He gave life to the fowls of the air. All those things God created, they came from him, and he had that creation power. And uh, listen, I, that's why I hate evolution so much, because it distracts from the power of God, the wisdom of God, and, uh, and puts it all in an uh, accident or, uh, you know, a gaseous explosion somewhere uh, millions and maybe billions of years ago. And out of that, we got all these, I mean, we got the universe, they say, 
It's an impossibility. It is an absolute impossibility. It is easier for me to believe that God stepped out of eternity in the time and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Before there was a sun and moon or stars, there was light. He is the light, and he is the life. And he created all of those things. You think about God giving life to the dust of the uh, uh, ground. Think about that. The Bible said God formed man out of the dust of the earth. He formed a body because the Bible says God breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. I'm talking about nothing but a heap of dust. And God formed it into a body, the body of a man. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of God. And the Bible says that man became a living soul because he had received that life from God. He is a living soul. He is an eternal soul. He will live somewhere forever and ever and ever. He'll either spend uh, uh, that forever in heaven or that forever in hell because he has eternal life. Not saying that it's salvation, but I'm just saying it has eternal life because it has an eternal soul. So out of the dust came life. It came eternal life. It came an eternal soul from the breath of God, from him who is life. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. creature. It's a new creation. And he said, the old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. And that's what happened. He became a new creature. And when I got saved, God breathed into my nostrils the breath of life, and I became born again. That soul got born again. It got regenerated. It was dead in trespasses and sins, as we just read in chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2, and tells us how we lived before that. But God gave life to the best of the earth. Man, what a God we serve. What a powerful God we serve. Creation life. And then notice there is resurrection life. He raised the dead. And the Bible says that's what he did for us. He says, notice in verse 1, And you hath he quickened, that means made alive, resurrected, who were dead in trespasses and sins. God gave life. God raised the dead. You think about Lazarus, and I don't have time to tell all the story, but Lazarus had died. And Mary and Martha still at the grave, and Jesus finally showed up. And they said, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. You're late, Lord. You're late. But I'll tell you something. He's never late. He's just on time. And, uh, and so he called Lazarus forth from the grave. He said, take away the tomb. And he called forth, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb, still bound in the grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. And they found out that he, that Jesus could not only heal the sick, he could raise the dead. And Lazarus to testify to that. And Mary and Martha and all those that they uh, that were there that day could stand and say, we saw it happen. We saw how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The widow's son was raised from the dead. The ruler's daughter was raised from the dead. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 18 it says, And when he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler, let's carefully, and worshipped him, saying, my daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Here's a man who believed that God could raise the dead. Here's a man who said, if you'll just come and lay a hand upon her. And Jesus said, I don't have to come. Your daughter has been raised from the dead. And when he got home, she was alive and well. Because God, the authority, the authority of heaven and hell said she now lives. Oh, it just takes his word. I was saved and born again because of the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who born to God, not by corruptible things, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
And that's how you got saved and I got saved, that God, we believe the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and we believe that, and we were saved. There's salvation life. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. He said, And you hath he quickened, made alive, resurrected, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Skip down to verse number 5. Even when we were what? Dead in sins, hath quickened us together, raised us together with Christ. By grace you're saved. And so we find salvation life. There was life, the source of life, God. There was creation life. There was resurrection life. And there is salvation life. And notice what he's seeing, said. And you hath he quickened. That word quickened means he's made alive, resurrected, who were dead in trespasses. And matter of fact, we ought to read verse 2. It says, When in time past you walked according to the course of this world. You know how lost people live? They let the world dictate the course. And according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil. We have fallen the devil. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We were disobedient to God before I was saved. I was disobedient to God. Disobedient to parents. I walked according to the course of the world. I walked according to the prince of the power of the air. The devil had an influence in my heart and soul. And in verse 3, he goes on to say, Among whom also we had our conversation. Paul said, I was no different. I had that same conversation. I had that same lifestyle. Those things are true of me. I walked according uh, to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in disobedience. All those three things. He said, I walked to the course of this world. I walked according to the prince of the power, and I walked in disobedience to God. You see what he's saying? There's salvation life. Sin brought death to the soul. He said to Adam and Eve in the garden, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He was not talking about physically, because they did not die physically. But they died spiritually. And no longer wanted to be in the presence of God, covered themselves and hid themselves in the garden. And God had to come like never before and said, Adam, Adam, where about Adam? He knew where Adam was. He knew why Adam was hiding. It was for Adam's good that he asked the question, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I was dead before I was saved. I was dead to God. I was dead to his spirit. I was dead to everything good and righteous and holy. I was dead. I could not make the connection. I could not understand what God was doing, what God was saying. But God resurrected the soul. Let me give you some great verses here. Look at chapter 1, verse 19. I'll be there. But in Titus 2, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, notice this, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So what happened when I got saved? I was regenerated and I was renewed. I was restored. I regained everything that I lost in Adam. He had eternal life. I had eternal life. I have a, he had the presence of God. I had the presence of God. He says in chapter 1, verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? Now notice what he's saying, that this greatness of God's power, this resurrection power, is to usward who believe. Notice what he says now in verse number 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Those are the demonic powers. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now notice what he's saying here. He's saying that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead has now been given, manifest to us. He said the greatness of his power. He said according to the working of his mighty power, 
when he raised him from the dead, when he set Christ at his own right hand in the heavenly places, when he put his name and put Christ above all principality and power and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all the things of the church. He's saying that power, listen to me, that power is available to every child of God. Oh, how, how weak lives we live when we don't take advantage of and, and draw upon that power that is to us word. The whole key is, is in verse 19. What is the greatening, exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And he describes this power and it's all to us word. It's all to every child of God. Saved, resurrected the soul and set us under the authority of Christ and gave us this great power. Can I give a testimony? I remember when I came to life. When I got saved, June 11th, 1969, in the evening of that service, after the service, I went back to the cabin. My Holy Ghost was working on my heart, and there was a, a college student there. He was from Washington Bible College. His uh, nickname was Rock. He was a weightlifter, and he was... <laughs> He, he had muscles they felt like rocks and uh, I said rock I want to be saved God's been dealing my heart I want to be saved I was 15 years old and he said uh, well let's get down here there was a little couch in the foyer you went into a little foyer and you went left and right into the big dormitory room back there where all the bunk beds were and where we stayed during the week and he said do you want me to pray and you pray after me I said no sir I want to pray myself. And so I came to life. I remember I remember uh, that song that we sang, the choir sang it. I remember when my burdens rolled away. I remember that day when God lifted the burden of my sin. I mean, the next day I was different. That night I was different. When I got up off my knees, I knew I was different. I had been saved. I had born again. I was alive. I could see things I never saw. I could hear things I'd never heard. I understand things I never uh, never comprehended. I loved things then I didn't love before. I desired things that I didn't want before. I was a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great power was put in my heart and my soul when I got saved and born again. I remember when my burdens rolled away. I remember the peace of God that came. I remember the next morning. I don't know if they knew or not knew, but I remember walking from the dormitory over to the dining hall for breakfast. Somebody saw me, one of the staff members saw me and said, you look different this morning. I said, I got saved last night. And uh, it even showed up on, a, on my face, my smile. My, I was different. God did that. God himself breathed into my nostrils the breath of life, and I became a living soul. Let me ask the question. Are you alive this morning? Are you alive unto God? Are you, can you hear God and see God and touch God, and can you feel his presence do you have the life of God flowing through your soul? Do you have the work of God moving in your heart? That's the manifest presence of God. If you're born again, you have new life. If you're born again, you have God's life. It is a spiritual life. It will make conscious the presence of God. And if you have this life, listen, you will express this life. You cannot suppress it. You can't hold it down. You can't hold it back. It will come out in your life. If you have life and you have spiritual life, it will come out. John chapter 4, verse 14, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he said to her, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him. Now she came to get water out of Jacob's well. But he said, Whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. 
but the waters that I give him shall be in him, listen, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He said, when you drink my water, you'll never thirst again. I'm telling you what, since I got saved, I've never thirsted for this world. I've never thirsted for, uh, for the things of the world. But I've had that well of water springing up in my heart. It's real. It is real. God's life is real. Salvation's real. It is real. I see people who sit in the pews, and they're dead. They're dead to God. They're dead to singing. They're dead to preaching. They're dead to the need of lost souls. They're dead to prayer. They're dead to the Bible. Dead to the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Dead to missions. They're just dead. Everything about them is dead. And yet they say they have eternal life and the life of God. Nothing spiritual moves them. They're just not moved by anything spiritual. But they can really get excited about the world. They can get excited about music, the latest music out in pop culture. They want to know, you know, who new song written by Taylor Swift or one of those people. And they love that, that world of music. They're fanatics about sports. They get excited about smartphones and the internet and fads and fashions and fun and parties, money and games and the latest new app for their phone. They get excited about that but coming to church is not exciting to them. I tell you, when I got saved, I, I, before I was saved, I didn't want to go to church. If I went to church, we went to Sunday school because my mother made me go. When I got saved, I went on because I wanted to go. There was a desire in my heart. Listen, tell me what you love. Tell me how you spend your time. Tell me how you spend your money. And I'll tell you whether you're saved or not. But the Bible says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, love the Father is not in him. And Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, and he said, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. That means a curse at the Lord's coming. He said, if you don't love Jesus, if he's not first in your life, you will be accursed at the coming of the Lord. Why? Because saved people love Jesus. Saved people love church. Saved people love preaching. Saved people love God. Saved people love uh, the pastor. Saved people love other folks in the church. We love the brethren. The Bible says we know that we pass from death and life because we love the brethren. I found out if you love somebody, you want to be close to them. You want to be near them. You love your family, and you want to be close to them. Our family will be coming up for Thanksgiving. Can't wait. Seven grandkids invading the parsonage. But it's always fun. Well, depending on how you define fun. But we have a great time. And uh, they're disciplined. They, they know how to behave. And uh, I'm telling you, I, I'm glad I got saved. And when I got saved, I got new life. I got new life. Now my physical life is going downhill. I'm feeling real tired right now. <laughs> but my fire in my soul and the life in my soul is still burning like it always did. And it's a well of water that springs up into everlasting life. It just keeps bubbling over, bubbling over, bubbling over. And um, I remember Brother Henry Milby telling something like that, and he said, uh, you know, you can stand out on a, um, a pond or a lake, and it'll be just a steel, no wind. It'll be just like a, what well, they call a sea of glass. It's just like glass. But if you keep watching, you'll see a little bubble come up. And he says, that means there's something alive down there. And he said, that fish, it might be a dead fish, and the gas coming up off of it. But he said, there's something down there that'll bubble up. And there's something down in here that bubbles up. And after 50 years of being saved, actually, uh, 
53 years of being saved, there's still a bubble that rises to the top. And I thank God that he did that for me. Let's bow for prayer.